Well, this morning's scripture, this morning's scripture certainly beckons us, it calls us to go below skin deep, well below. I want to begin by sharing with you something that happened a few years ago. A few years ago, a young man, young man put his soul up for sale. He put his soul up for sale on eBay, the internet auction site. Adam Bertle, a University of Washington student, sold his soul for $400 before the listing was removed, and he was consequently suspended from the site. Please realize I make no warranties as to the condition of the soul, he wrote. As of now, it's near mint condition with only minor scratches. Due to difficulties involved with removing my soul, the winning bidder will have to wait until my natural death. eBay has blocked similar auctions in the past, but somehow Bertle's offer slipped through. The bidding started at five cents. And Bertle's former girlfriend, his former girlfriend bid $6.66, 666, but his girlfriend was uh, overtaken, former girlfriend I should say, she ended up getting overtaken in the final hour of the auction when a Des Moines, Iowa woman bid the price of Bertle's soul to $400. I don't think she's going to be able to collect on my soul, to be honest, Bertle said, adding that he did not intend for the ad to be taken seriously. He went on to write, I was just bored, and I'm a geek, he added. So anytime I'm bored, I go back to my internet. Now, my guess is that over the centuries, many Many people have sold their soul simply and solely because they were bored. Now you talk about a bad bargain. What good is it, asked Jesus, for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Our text assumes that assumes from the get-go that we do not live in a world that's simply material. There's a spiritual side, to be sure, to our universe. I'm sure most of us are familiar with the popular rock singer Madonna, who sang a song of praise to being materialistic in her hit Material Girl. In the chorus, most of you probably know this well, the chorus says, we are living in a material world and I am a material girl. And Madonna, which you may not know, is that she often actually remarks that this is the one song. This is the one song she most regrets recording. Material girl. Because that became her nickname. Material girl. She's also said that if she had known this, she probably would have never recorded it. Well, it stuck. And she's had to work very, very hard to get people to quit thinking of her in that light. A material girl. Actually, to many of us, she seems to be a very confused woman. Let's face it. Let's face it, many people in this world live as if this is only a material world. Not long after Jesus taught about gaining the whole world and forfeiting one's soul, there lived a man named Nero. Nero was a Roman emperor who, he lived in glorious splendor in every way. He commanded that porches, that porches a mile long be built around his palace. The ceiling of his banquet hall was equipped with hidden showers that lightly sprayed perfume upon all who came to visit him. 
His crown, in adjusted dollars, his crown was worth a half million dollars, and his mules were shod with silver. Whenever he traveled, a thousand chariots accompanied him, and he refused, absolutely refused, to wear the same garment twice, no matter how costly and beautiful it was. Taxing people unmercifully, he was able to pay, friends, extravagant, extravagant sums of money to anybody who could devise new methods of entertaining him. Yet, yet with all his riches and splendor, he was a peevish, gloomy, dissatisfied man. The immense wealth that he had amassed, it it couldn't satisfy his soul. In spite of having every pleasure that this world can afford, Nero, Nero took his own life. It happens. It happens. People seek after wealth, they seek fame, they seek sensual pleasure, they seek every means of escape possible, but if they do not seek God, if they live only in a material world, they never attain satisfaction. Some of you know the story of a young man who was born in a log cabin in Oregon. His parents were hippies. They named him for the river of life. Not the river of life found in scripture, mind you, but the river of life found in a novel by Herman Hess. River Phoenix. River Phoenix was one of the, he was one of the most respected young actors of his generation. He and his siblings broke into show business at a young age and he was soon helping to support his entire family, ultimately buying his parents a farm. Well, in 1985, he starred in his very first movie, Stand By Me. It's a great movie, I think. Stand By Me, he had it all, fame, he had wealth, He had the respect of his peers, and yet his life ended on a dirty curb outside a trendy West Hollywood nightclub as the result of a massive drug overdose. He's only 23. The witnesses say that River was hardly even noticed as he went into convulsions on the sidewalk outside the club. What happened to River Phoenix? Now, whatever River Phoenix was searching for in life, he obviously did not find it. What good is it, asked Jesus, for a man to gain the whole world's fame, fortune, adulation, yet forfeit his soul? King Charlemagne lived from 742 to 814 A.D. He conquered most of Western Europe. Everywhere Charlemagne's troops went, they spread education and the Christian religion. His rule unified and stabilized much of Europe, making him one of the most powerful rulers in all of history. Yet, in spite of all Charlemagne's power, he arranged, he arranged at his death to have his body displayed with his hand resting on our verse for today. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Charlemagne knew such an exchange was a bad Bad bargain, indeed. This is more than a material world. And we're more than material beings. As one philosopher put it so memorably, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human, human experience. It sounds very new age, but there's a whole lot of measure of truth to it. We are spiritual beings having a human 
experience. There's a world of difference. In other words, we have a soul. Or better yet, we are a soul. And many, as you know, have searched to find a spot in the body which they could identify as the soul. That's fruitless. It's fruitless. You will find the soul in the same place you find love, hope, peace, joy, and a host of other positive emotions. You can capture none of these emotions in a test tube. But we know they exist. And just because you and I cannot see love, for example, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. We know it exists. We've seen love in action. And just because you can't find a, a physical location for the soul within our body does not mean that it does not exist. We have a soul. Some scholars would prefer to say we are a soul. Our soul is who we really are. Don't let anybody tell you that the soul does not exist. We're created in the image of Almighty God. That does not mean God looks like us. It means that there's something, that there's something divine within us. The soul is who you are. It's what makes you distinctive. You're more than a nose. You're more than a mouth. You're more than a pair of ears. You have a distinct personality. Even if we could eliminate all your physical characteristics, you, the real you, would still exist. That's your soul. Preeminent atomic scientist Dr. Werner von Braun once spoke these comforting words. He wrote, science tells us that nothing in nature, nothing, not even the tiniest particle, can disappear without a trace. Nature does not know extinction. All it knows is transformation. Now, if God applies this fundamental principle to the most minute in insignificant parts of his universe, doesn't it make sense to assume that he applies it also to the masterpiece of his creation, the human soul? And everything science has taught me and continues to teach me strengthens my belief in the continuality of our spiritual ex existence after death. Nothing disappears without a trace. This is more than a material world. We're more than simply material creatures. We have a soul, a soul that by the grace of God even survives the grave. And so Jesus says to us, take care of your soul. If your soul is all that survives you after death, you ought to take care of it. In fact, taking care of your soul, the real you, is the most important task you and I have. Now, how do you do that? How do you take care of your soul? Well, friends, let's look at it this way. Your God holds the owner's manual to our souls. He wrote the owner's manual. That means he knows you better than you know you, and he knows the difference between your real need and your perceived need. That's where faith and trust come in. Much more on that in weeks coming. The creator of our souls, the creator of our very souls and all that ever is or will be tells us very plainly if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. And all God's people said, Amen.